हेलो यस हाय सुजन हाउ आर यू ओह रियली ओह वेरी स्ट्रेंज क्यूज आई बीन वेटिंग ऑन स्काइप and it keeps saying pending pending contract request so i wasn't sure oh no i thought it was my request i was waiting on you to accept it because i sent it out as well strange <laughs> it says contact request sent um please add me as a yeah it's just kind of weird No, I think it's Safina Dot Hussain. Did I sent you an invite? You should have. It's Safina Dot Hussain. Okay. But otherwise, this works with me if it works for you. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm in Mumbai, and it's around. Five thirty in the evening here. Yes. Uh huh. Um, Raman Joy, I think he's the one who. Yeah. Yes, he's lovely. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for having me.
Um, for us, actually, values is pretty much the heart of the organization. Um, and how we do our work is determined by our values. Um, so I'll give you a really small example. We want girls to go to school. Parents are against girls going to school. So there are, there's one way to do it is to threaten parents or to intimidate parents and force them to send their daughters to school. But that's completely against our values. But how we do it, uh, do we do it through raising awareness? Do we do it, uh, you know, what we consider the right way? Uh, the way with the right values is really important. So it has to reflect in every single thing that we do. is not just what we're doing, but how we're doing it. Mm -hmm. So one of our key values is empathy. Um, there's obviously equity. Gender equity is a key value. So it must re reflect not just in our work, but also in our organization. I mean, Educate Girls can't be an organization of 9,000 men working for girls' education. There has to be internal equity. Uh, when we collect data, we make sure that it's equitable. Are we only collecting information about the father and never asking any questions to the mother? Because we also know that, you know, I mean, all of this has great impact. Um, we know that when mothers are educated, their children are far more likely to be educated. So our data systems need that lens of gender equity. Our HR systems need gender equity as a key uh, lens that we do. Our program, obviously. But every aspect of the organization is governed by those values. Yes. Mm -hmm. The beneficiaries are children who are in school and out of school. So what we're doing is our beneficiaries would be girls who are out of school, uh, who are bringing back into the school system. They could either be never enrolled or dropped out. Our beneficiaries are boys and girls who are in school currently, but whose learning outcomes are, are below grade level um, because they're special needs kids or because they have learning lag, which we actually come in and we supplement and we run our programs to make sure that everybody's learning outcomes are increasing. Um, these beneficiaries would include girls who are adolescent girls who go through our life skills program. So basically it's children uh, when we're talking about the, three point, um, the over 3 million. It's yes, but we don't count them. <laughs> we count only the children in our program. Yes, and in a very short amount of time, in less than a decade, we, we scaled and we grew really rapidly. And again, I think it comes back to one of our key values, which is collaboration. Um, we realized from the beginning that, you know, there are lots of solutions out there that we were going to partner as much as possible uh, so that we didn't have to reinvent anything. So we actually partnered with other NGOs to teach us how to do community mobilization. We partnered with UNICEF to say, come and teach us how to do learning best in the classroom. We partnered with Booz and Company to say, come and help us build our five-year strategic plan. We partnered with a talent firm, Mercury Urval, to say, can you help us think about our second line management and our, you know, our entire HR pieces. So it's because of all of these, there, and obviously we don't run our own schools. We partner with the government to saying allow us to come in and help make your school stronger. So it's the partnerships and that collaboration um, between for-profit, non-profit, and the government that has actually allowed this model to grow and scale very rapidly in the nine years. And also, at a cost of around you know, $4 per child per year, you're actually um, having clear outcomes on enrollment and retention and learning.
donation. <laughs> Just all 100% donations from individuals, from corporate foundations, from family foundations, um, online portals. So there's a variety of people um, and, and different kind of people who are coming together to support our work. Mm -hmm. Actually, this is part of, you know, the sustainable development goals, um, and the government is doing a good job in places, but there are areas. So when I first started, I went to the government and I said, where should I go? India is a huge country. I mean, it's a bit over a billion people. Just the state of Rajasthan alone has 80,000 elementary schools, one state. So the pr problem is huge. And the government actually came and gave me a list saying, these are our 26 critical gender gap districts. 26 out of some 650 districts, right? And nine of these were in Rajasthan, which is where we work right now, um, and now also in Madhya Pradesh. But really, we are only working in those areas where the execution gap is the widest. So the government, you know, the regular government school business as usual just cannot solve the problem because it's, it's really, really, really broken. And that's where we're coming in and supplementing the government's efforts to um, saying, you know, we, do we want to wait till 2070 for a tribal to have universal primary education, or can we come in and work together to accelerate that progress? Uh, no, I do not believe that it's a permanent requirement. Um, our main goal is that, yes, we should put ourselves out of business, or at least for that particular outcome. So I, I shouldn't have to do this for third, fourth, and fifth graders in terms of learning, um, because once the generation changes and I've educated the entire generation, let's say over 10 years, um, you know, that equilibrium would have shifted higher anyway. Then A, I go out of business, or B, I come and solve a difficult problem, let's say you know, the 12th grade or college education. That outcome needs to, needs to change. But yes, I should not need to do this forever. I'm sorry, you broke up for a second there. Could you just uh, repeat the question? I didn't, I didn't completely hear it. Um, yes, I do believe. I do believe that values are key and that they should be incorporated and they make more sense. So, for example, diversity, you know, making sure that your, your board has, has women or has representation. I mean, data shows now that actually leads to more ethical companies, that leads to higher profitability and return on investment. So I think there is data and even evidence building up now saying that if you have the right values, uh, you know, your talent stays with you longer. If you have, everybody wants to be part of something which is, which has some inherent core that they can latch onto. And I think um, companies that have really strong values also have, they attract good people and good people stay with them longer. 
And it's also, I think, we're so connected with our communities, with climate, with so many things. How can we only work towards just profit? I mean, I think it's a very short-term gain versus, you know, uh, being values-driven also means, I think, longevity and and a longer-term gain in perspective. Absolutely. I mean, I think the Tatas are a big example, um, you know, of, of a very values driven country, uh, sorry, company. And they're highly profitable. Um, they have been at, you know, at the top of, uh, you know, all the leagues and stuff in terms of uh, companies for the longest time. And they get exceptional talent. And every time you meet with them, you actually see that their values sort of permeate everything they do. Um, so that's like one company that I would say, because it's been around for a very, very long time. They may have the ups and downs, but in general, they are kind of known for their uh, deep values and the fact that they do a lot of uh, incredible work through their foundation. So have, they have very, very deep roots into the community. Um, no, I'm not. Sorry. Mhm. Mhm. Yeah. I think there's several. I mean, Tom's shoes. I think they have tied in really well their business and their values um, and their philosophy. I think it kind of just totally blends uh, together. Uh, is another kind of a standout example of how well they've done it. I, I definitely think uh, that has been a key, but I also feel one of the things that has driven us and is different about Educate Girls is our outcomes-driven approach. So if I had to take something for, from the for-profit sector into the nonprofit world, I would say that the nonprofit sector actually doesn't have a good efficiency indicator, which the for-profit sector has. Actually, profit is a great efficiency indicator. If you're not making a profit, you'll go out of business. But in the nonprofit world, unfortunately, if you're good at fundraising, then you can just keep existing and you may or may not have impact on the ground. So at Educate Girls, we've always struggled with the fact that how do we make sure that money translates directly into impact? And that's our outcomes-driven approach. And that led to the world's first development impact bond in education, which is a payment by results contract. So the entire organization in its DNA has delivery to outcomes. So that means that as a nonprofit, we're very different from other nonprofits that we have this incredible efficiency indicator in terms of our outcomes um, that is now embedded in the DNA of the organization. And I would say that is a key kind of differentiator. So what is it that we're looking or what is the outcome that we're working for? Is that what you're asking? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So first of all, in the development impact bond, all uh, funding that we receive in that transaction is tied to two outcomes. And there are two outcomes. One is enrollment of -of out-of-school girls. And their learning outcomes of, you know, children 
which are measured by a third party in a treatment school. And then we also have regular government schools, which act as control. And it's only on your net uh, improvement that you're delivering over the control schools that you get paid. So that, it, yes. So it's basically that I'm getting paid. I deliver my program, but I get paid only on pure impact. So if my children move up two levels of learning in a year and a regular government school, which is similar, moves up one, I get paid for the balance one unit that has been added to that child's learning only simply because of my program. So it's very, very rigorous. Um, and it brings that efficiency. And, it, and so because of that, we had to build a very uh, robust kind of management system dashboards, our field staff had to be given kind of flexibility and enhanced training so that we can deliver in this fashion. <laughs> so we are getting a lot of interest, but currently this is the only transaction of its kind in the entire world. So there isn't any other that is delivering in this way. Uh, no, I think I think you've covered it all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.